Welcome, everyone. I'm Kerry Kalanisi, the director of the Penn Program on Regulation. Uh, it's delightful to see familiar faces here and to welcome everyone to our first workshop of the spring semester uh, in our year-long series on artificial intelligence and climate change, uh, which is uh, uh, an effort to bring together and think about uh, two of the most consequential developments of our time, uh, artificial intelligence and climate change. Uh, and we're also doing so while bringing together students and faculty and staff and fellows from across the university. Our RSVP list, for example, has uh, folks here from eight different schools at Penn, and I'm really excited about uh, that interdisciplinary mix that we have. We have two more workshops coming up later this spring, and announcements about those will be sent to all of you who registered and will be listed on our Penn Program on Regulation website. The series here is made possible in part by the support of the uh, Environmental Innovations Initiative at the Provost Office. I'm happy to thank them. Also happy to thank our various co-sponsors, the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy, which has been so gracious to host us here today. Uh, we're really appreciative of being able to be in this wonderful space. Uh, we're also uh, pleased to co-sponsor with the Center for Technology and Innovation and Competition. Uh, the Warren Center for Network and Data Sciences, and the Wharton Climate Center. Uh, before introducing our featured speaker, just a couple of housekeeping items. Today's workshop is being recorded, and the recording will be posted to the YouTube channel of the Penn Program on Regulation. Also, after the presentation by Professor Sunstein, we look forward to hearing from you with your questions and comments during the Q&A uh, portion, which I will uh, help coordinate. Please just raise your hand. I'll call on you. And then we have people who will bring a microphone uh, to you so that uh, we can make sure you're heard by everyone. Now, to lead off uh, our spring semester workshop series, and, and what, what, there's so many different reasons why I'm so excited about our uh, featured speaker. Uh, not only is he the leading uh, legal scholar of our time, uh, but he's someone who is distinctively equipped to think about this intersection between artificial intelligence and climate change. He's written for many, many years about environmental regulatory issues and climate change. Uh, and he's also been working on issues related to artificial intelligence. And today he's going to be bringing these uh, together and thinking about how AI, AI tools might be used to help structure individual decision making in ways that can help combat uh, climate change. Uh, he is someone who um, it can, I think, genuinely be said needs no introduction, but I will 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 nevertheless offer a, a brief one. Um, he is the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard, the founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy at the Harvard Law School, uh, an internationally renowned scholar of constitutional law, administrative law, public policy, behavioral economics. He received the Holberg Prize in 2018 from the government of Norway, uh, which is sometimes described as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Law and the Humanities. And he has a distinguished record of public service, among other many other important positions uh, throughout his career. Uh, outside of academia and in government, he served from 2009 to 2012 as the administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, he is someone who has authored uh, more books than most academics have published articles, uh, the, some of the most recent um, being How to Interpret the Constitution, and some of the most popular being Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness with Richard Thaler. Gives me really a distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Cass Sunstein to you today. Please join me in welcoming him. 
Well, it is a complete thrill to be here. I'm trying to take in the room. I see you in the back. I hope you're comfortable standing there. Is that okay? You're leaning a little bit against. That gives you a little comfort, I hope, and I, this side of the room. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and there's actually empirical evidence that's relevant to my topic. Uh, as soon as I landed, I sent a note to my wife saying that I was thrilled to be here, and she responded, great, have a nice day. And I thought, is she a bot? Has my wife become a bot? <laughs> That's not normal to say, have a nice day. So I responded immediately, um, Samantha, are you a bot? And she responded, LOL. And I don't know what kind of evidence that is. Would a bot be quick enough to say LOL? Yes. Okay. So we have an, a mystery which is not unrelated to our topic. Uh, the climate problem. Let's notice preliminarily, shall we, uh, that it has more than 17 sources. So the foundations of extreme heat, of flooding, of drought, of wildfire at all are multiple. That our policy options are also numerous, that we could have a carbon tax, we could have ramped up energy efficiency requirements, we could have fuel economy requirements on steroids, we could have and we do have subsidies. There are economic barriers to some of the policies, including expense, either for consumers or for shareholders. We won't use the terrible word stakeholders. Shouldn't we abolish the word stakeholders? Has any of you used the word stakeholder? What does that even mean? I think it means person. So we can say person. Persons face economic barriers. Political barriers include interest group pressures and also reasonable disagreement. Let's put reasonable disagreement in bold letters and cry it from the rafters. Disagreements about what to do about climate change uh, span a reasonable range. And there are behavioral barriers, including lack of information. What should I do to deal with greenhouse gas emissions or to improve resilience? Inertia and habits are really important. Here's a psychological issue. If you ask a large random population first, do you believe climate change is a serious problem? and note that the response to climate change is taxes and regulation, the percentage of people who will say that climate change is a serious problem is a lot lower than if you ask them the same question and say the response to climate change is growth, innovation, and jobs of the future. So people's judgment about the reality of climate change is importantly affected by their belief about the response to climate change is what the response to climate change is likely to be, which suggests that a psychologically informed approach to, let's say, skepticism about climate change is to emphasize, if it's credible, that there are responses to climate change that are inspiring and thrilling rather than scary and horrify. Let's keep that in mind. Solution aversion is a psychological phenomenon. If you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I'm sorry, you have a problem, you're gonna be sad and miserable for the next 15 years, you might think, I kind of don't believe that doctor. But if the doctor says you have a problem and the solution is going to be a fresh start, which is going to have all sorts of fantastic opportunity for you, 
you might think I believe the diagnosis. Yes, that's the parallel. Okay, uh, I'm going to be emphasizing here choosers. What do people choose with respect to climate-related things? What do they choose to eat? What do they choose to derive energy from? What do they choose to drive? Each of us, each of you, is going to make in the next 24 hours, I predict, with high confidence, at least five choices, which will have consequences for greenhouse gas emissions. Let's notice, shall we, that there are two challenges that choosers face. One involves internalities and the other involves externalities. To get hold of internalities, let's notice, shall we, that the Department of Energy recently issued a rule involving refrigerators, and it emphasized in its refrigerator rule that the benefits of increased energy efficiency for refrigerators include reduced greenhouse gas emissions, that's externality reduction, and include economic savings for choosers, those are internality reducing uh, outcomes. So if you reduce the costs imposed on your future self, and I see at least some people in the room are wearing masks, you are reducing costs imposed on your future self. This is not a judgment about whether how many people should be wearing masks, just noticing that self-protection is protection against internalities or we can do things that will reduce ex intern externalities. A spoiler alert is both externalities and internalities can be reduced through choice engines informed by AI. They can be not paternalistic and really unintrusive, when they can be pretty intrusive and pretty paternalistic. Let's have a notation here that the climate change problem is daunting. Have you noticed? Its size is often dispiriting, but let's notice also a phrase sometimes used in the US government in the face of daunting problems, which is better is good. If you reduce the number of tons of greenhouse gas emissions by X percent in the next six months, that's good, even if X is a low number. That is a, a, a hopeful note to emphasize. The main thread here is that choice engines can reduce internalities and externalities, and in the process, they can be distributionally good in the sense that the reduction of internalities and externalities can be helpful to the people who are struggling most in life. It could help people at the bottom of the economic ladder. Many people care about that. We're going to be covering a lot of material. Keep in mind the lower internalities, lower externalities, main threads. Okay, if you're trying to figure out what to do with respect to this summer, what to get, if it's really cold in February or really warm in July, what to buy, either because holidays are coming up or because you're feeling a little uh, prosperous, uh, you might flounder in the sense that the choices here might be difficult. AI could help us through choice engines to make sounder decisions with respect to what we care about. Here's something real. This is just an example, and I'm not an investor in the, uh, in the material from which I'm drawing here. This is just random. That's good. There are choice engines. You can find them online. They are developing. Here is something which self-describes as a data-driven, energy-aware choice engine platform discovered after these slides were initially completed, by the way. So this is a late edition. It's an empirical edition. This is real, not made up. 
an online consumer division support system, which uses technology, including, I'm confident, AI, to try to give people clarity about the costs of energy-related choices. The hope of the choice engine is to produce environmental benefits and economic benefits, thus cutting externalities and internalities. The particular numbers don't matter much for present purposes. Let's just use four letters and two words for both categories, a lot. A lot in the way of environmental benefit and a lot in the way of economic savings. Okay, choosing can be very difficult with respect to greenhouse gas related decisions and a choice engine might be a gift for each of us deciding what to choose. If we care about externalities, choosing is also difficult and a choice engine might provide a social gift for all of us if we care about externality reduction by showing us exactly how to do that. Okay, this is a picture from about a decade ago from right outside the Oval Office. And either in that conversation or in a conversation which was temporarily adjacent to it, the two people there were discussing the social cost of carbon, which is the economic value assigned to a ton of carbon emissions. Is this a familiar term, the social cost of carbon? Take it as the number meant to reflect the damage done by a ton of carbon emissions. It's right now in the vicinity of $200, according to many experts, including those at the Environmental Protection Agency. That's the global rather than the domestic number. And it's a reminder that better is good because of everyone in Philadelphia reduces their emissions by X number of tons in 2024. The monetary equivalent of that is gonna be very high unless X is vanishingly small. Okay, for either internalities and externalities, there are four problems. First, if each of us is deciding, let's say, what to eat and what to buy, it would be miraculous if each of us has adequate information about the environmental consequences of those choices. So at the University of Chicago, where I taught for a number of years, what I've said with respect to this slide so far is not fighting words, it's just standard stuff, a lack of information on the part of choosers. It's also the case that human beings are on average unrealistically optimistic, that 90% of drivers in some studies believe that they're better than the average driver, that 94% of university professors in a study believe that they're better than the average university professor, that 100% of people approximately believe that their sense of humor is better than the average sense of humor. That's because they know what's funny. Optimistic bias can lead to mistakes with respect to environmentally relevant choices. It can produce a form of motivated reasoning by which people believe that their own decisions will have no effect or will have a good effect. Inertia means that the status quo has a kind of halo associated with it, even a magnetic quality. And to change from one stream of decisions to another is often uh, unwelcome, if only because it requires people to exert cognitive effort. And if inertia is in play, the problem of climate change will be formidable, if only for that reason, to switch from X to Y is something the human mind might not like very much. By the way, status quo bias is a famous behavioral phenomenon of relevance to internalities and externalities. 
a nominee for the most uh, instructive paper that no one's ever heard of is from a while ago, approximately 10 years ago, about status quo label bias. And the basic finding is if you say in Philadelphia, the policy is, for example, that people can't park on certain streets near the university, and then you ask a random population, should parking be opened up? People will say, no, shouldn't. That would be the majority view. Or if you say in random streets near the university in Philadelphia, people can park. Should that be changed so that the parking spaces are reserved for bicyclists or walkers or something? People say, no, it should be the same. Shouldn't open up space for bicyclists, just let people park. So what is labeled as the status quo has strong appeal. And that is uh, a powerful uh, deterrent to policy change. Why the status quo label has a halo associated with it is not known so well. It might be that there's an informational signal given by the existing policy, which people hear pretty loud and clear and will be reluctant to ignore in the face of a proposed change. Okay, should we do a little experiment in this room? Thanks to the organizers and uh, Professor Coglianese, all of your brains have been attached to a monitor. We've done this through AI. I'm so sorry, we're not being really invasive. Okay, that's not true. Your brains aren't attached to a monitor, but let's imagine. I want you to think of yourself on a beach tomorrow, your favorite beach. Will you please? Okay, we do have the brain monitors and two of you aren't thinking about a beach. You're thinking like about schoolwork or something. Think about the beach, all of you. Okay, here's what just happens. Uh, a part of your brain that lights up when people think about themselves just lit up. It's called the narcissistic part of the brain. When you thought of yourself on a beach tomorrow, that part of the brain lit up. That's what happens. Now let's do it again, but think of yourself on a beach, not tomorrow, but a year and a day from today, 2025. Can you think of yourself on a beach? Your favorite beach? Now I'll tell you what just happened. For some of you, the part of the brain that lit up when you thought about yourself tomorrow on the beach lit up again. For a lot of you, it didn't. For a lot of you, thinking of yourself on a beach a year and a day from now is thinking of someone who is, in terms of your brain, a stranger, neurologically a stranger. Now, here's the trick. Those of you for whom that part of the brain did not light up are more likely to show present bias. You want $10 today, not $20 in a week. Now, even if that part of your brain that lights up when you think about yourself did light up when you thought about yourself a year and a day from now, you might show present bias because it's hardwired into the human mind that the short term is extremely salient, the long term is a foreign country, later land, and we're not sure we're going to visit. That's a problem for temperature, and it's a problem for choices that bear up. Okay, algorithms or AI, large language models emphatically included, have great promise. Now let's dive a little deeper, shall we, to vindicate the intuition. And we're going to complicate it a little bit and be a tiny bit fussy. Is it excruciatingly lame to have the words bear with me on a slide with a picture of a bear? Guess whether AI generated that bear or I generated that bear. AI generated that bear. Okay, here are three things that are environmentally relevant and at least one is climate relevant. Home energy reports, calorie labels, and labels for sugary drinks. Now think of these as examples on which we have data one of which is environmentally highly relevant. You might get at your house a report 
saying you are using a lot of energy. Would you like to reduce? And the report might tell you something about the environmental impact or about the economic effect. It could do one or the other. Or you could have a calorie label or a label on sugary drinks. Here's data on the effects of sugary drinks labels, which has close parallels in the context of environmental labels and of calorie labels. But this is about sugary drinks. And this is going to be subtle and really important. It's not my data, but it's new and it's kind of explosive. On average, labels on sugary drinks affect consumer behavior and in the right way. They reduce demand for such drinks. So we could think of a climate change AI policy that's just labeling things that have environmental consequences so that people see it. And let's stipulate that internalities is what we're concerned about. On average, it works. But the labels on sugary drinks have greater effects on some consumers than on others. Things are getting more interesting and a little nervous making, I think, in that bit of the slide. And here's the kind of kicker. Labels can lead people who do not have self-control problems to consume less in the way of sugary drinks while having a significantly smaller effect on people who do have self-control problems. In addition, a lot of people don't like seeing graphic warning labels. In fact, the average person in a large sample reported being willing to pay nothing for the, the, the graphic warning label and would pay a dollar to avoid seeing it. People don't want it. That suggests it's inevitable that labels of this kind are helping some people and hurting others. It might be that it's helping the people who don't need help and hurting the people who do need help. It's possible that they're causing harm on balance. Okay, do we know each other enough for me to tell you a story from the dental chair? I was the dentist. This isn't going to be terrible. I was at the dentist about two weeks ago, and I had a dental, dental hygienist who's famously amazing at her job and not a lot of fun to work with. And she was saying, more flossing, floss every minute. You have to floss. Your life is going to be one of flossing from now on. You can't go to pen. You have to be flossing every day, every second of every day. Floss, floss, floss. And this went on for a while. And there were other words that were synonyms for flossing, or maybe worse than flossing, and or high-tech flossing. And finally, I heard myself saying to her, you know, there are two things to focus on. One is teeth, and the other is emotional well-being. And I said, my teeth are going to do better, but I'm not enjoying this a whole lot. And she said, oh, meaning she was a good person, but she was mean, and she was knowing that she shouldn't be so mean. So the data with respect to labels is showing there can be hedonic effects, rather positive, positive negative, from a climate-related intervention. They can have different effects on different populations. And the average treatment effect doesn't tell us what we need to know. It doesn't tell us the welfare effects. You can have a positive attribution, of positive treatment, average treatment effect while having a negative welfare effect. And that bears on design. Okay, let's have an analogy to climate change choice engines involving retirement. I promise we're going to get to climate change directly in our, into a hurry. For retirement savings, people all around our country need choice engines that help them make the right decisions. Some of them might be mischievous or random or coarse or clueless. Some of them might show behavioral biases of their own people might be automatically enrolled in plans with high fees. 
They might be automatically enrolled in plans that aren't diversified. They might be automatically enrolled in dominated plans. But current practice is a lot better than that. And I'm going to draw on this. OK, climate change. This is an opportunity, a big one and a golden one. And it has a degree of urgency, given the fact that people are making climate-related choices all over the world that are environmentally damaging and causing economic harm, including for people who can't bear the relevant economic harm very well. In India, the prime minister has launched a life initiative which is designed to encourage environmentally better choices with particular emphasis on climate change. This is abstract, this slide. It refers to several policies. It's a work in progress. And the question is, how might AI help? Imagine, if you would, a choice engine focused on internalities that asks people, everyone in this room, what do you like most in cars? And it might show you the full range of economic costs, including the costs of operating a vehicle over time. If that's so, choice engines might have a paternalistic feature. They might suggest that the RAV4 hybrid is best for you. I'm looking at one of you. That's the best one for you. Whereas for you, the Tesla is better, even if the RAV4 hybrid might not be the one that would come top to mind and the Tesla might seem off-footing. The choice engine would try to overcome lack of information, optimistic bias, present bias, and inertia on the part of people who use them. If we have an internally focused, climate-sensitive, choice engine, it might preserve freedom of choice in the sense that it is deferential to the diversity of individual tastes, including values that are pro-environmental if and only if you have that. Got it? A choice engine could say, do you want to reduce your emissions? And it could do that as a prompt designed to trigger conscience or it could do it in a more neutral way, just designed to elicit values. This could be done for motor vehicles, energy providers, and appliances. And notwithstanding the earlier slide, which is a real site that uses choice engines, we are in very early days with respect to this possible future. Insofar as we're dealing with internalities, it might be right to focus on libertarian paternalism via AI, meaning choice preserving, but paternalistic. The Tesla for you, it might be suggested given what you care about, but you would ultimately have freedom of choice. Bub and Pildes and Conley are quick references to uh, professors who think that choice preserving paternalism is not what the doctor ordered in cases in which people show a propensity to err, suggesting, and let's just put this as a placeholder, that a more aggressive choice engine might be a good idea, even if all we're concerned about is internalities and not externalities. Is this clear? If you think that people's choices with respect to refrigerators are a little like people's choices with respect to, let's say, retirement plans, you might think a mandate is justified because it's so informationally demanding and likely susceptible to behavioral biases. Okay, externalities. This is a, a thrilling, unexplored frontier. A choice engine could take externalities on board by using, for example, the social cost of carbon to inform choices. A choice engine might say that a ton of carbon emissions is $200.
and here's good, better, and best for you with respect to refrigerators or clothes washers or clothes dryers or motor vehicles, given that cost. Is this easy to visualize? Maybe one of you has the technical capacity to des design it. So people are deciding what car to buy. And then we have a choice engine that shows you all the internality information, and it might just slap on the externality information too and ask you, what do you want to do given that? A choice engine that includes the externality might do that by default. That's your choice engine. Or it might do so if and only if choosers ask. And if this seems a little exhaust, exotic, I'm thinking that Prince Harry has founded a website called Travel, Travelocity, which is a lower tech version of exactly this with respect to travel generally and focused on climate change in particular, partnering with some of the largest travel companies to do something like what's just being described. But last I looked, it doesn't involve AI. It involves something so 2022. Okay, we could uh, imagine varying levels of freedom of choice. We could compare a choice engine that is aggressive with respect to externalities that could complement or be a substitute for a corrective tax or a subsidy. So we can imagine a subsidy like in the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, we could imagine a carbon tax, and we could complement these with choice engines. Okay, a choice engine could be really simple. It could be offering a little information and a few options to consumers, or it could be a tell me everything choice engine living up to its name. And consumers might be asked, what kind of choice engine do you want? It might be that for a certain population by default, it would be keep it simple. And then you could ask, I want tell me everything, or it could be just the opposite. Okay, these are points about mass regulation. Emphasize, as we should, that some consumers would benefit a lot from buying electric cars, some not so much. Some people have a keen taste for electric cars, some not. Choice engines should allow people to identify cars that have their preferred mix. Choice engines could help people to reduce externalities if that's what they want to do. Okay. Um, there's a signal given by consumer choices. If you're driving an electric car in some parts of this country, you get the equivalent of a reputational subsidy. People think, hooray for you. There are parts of the country where if you're driving an electric car, people think, what's wrong with you? That environmentally relevant choices are either taxed or subsidized by the relevant social meaning. Have you noticed I'm not wearing a tie right now? I hope not keenly recognize that because if it, you did, I made the wrong choice. A uh, judgment was that not wearing a tie was not a signal of anything in particular post COVID, but there was a time when not wearing a tie was a signal. Climate related choices have a meaning and a choice engine might help to change the meaning and eventually to create cascade effects in the environmentally preferred direction. Okay, here are some risks. First, those who design choice engines might be self-interested or malevolent. They might exploit behavioral biases, and AI and algorithms are threatening to do exactly that in a way that signals the potential presence of manipulation. There's some data suggesting that large language models do not only hallucinate, but also replicate behavioral biases that human beings show for reasons that are uh, mysterious. 
We don't fully understand the relationship between human biases and large language model biases, but they seem in the same kind of behavioral universe. That's a problem. That suggests that the use of AI-powered choice engines could be good for climate change if they're bias correcting, but not if they're bias reinforcing. A second category of risk is if a choice engine is coarse and so replicates the problem of mass interventions. If they use a few simple cues, like your income and your age and your education, they might not be really good enough for you. And if this is abstractions, notice if you would that American consumers are making a lot of choices which are not in their economic interest, which is particularly searing if the people are making those choices are economically vulnerable. A third category of risk is, as noted, AI might turn out to suffer from its own behavioral biases, potentially showing biases that haven't even been named yet. It's also possible that AI is going to show biases that are novel. Um, can I tell you, because I'm interested in behavioral biases, I've asked la large language models to identify a new bias. But everyone does that, right? That was, that's not idiosyncratic to me. Okay, you probably ask better questions of ChatGPT. I've asked it repeatedly now to identify a new bias, and the, the answers are terrible. It gives a name to a bias, like it'll call it the identifying new bias is bias, Let's say, and then it'll spell it out. And it, it's, it's not good at it. It doesn't even understand, for reasons I don't quite get, what a behavioral bias is. On the other hand, by contrast, algorithms, and this is very new, are, show, are very promising in identifying human biases that no human being has identified before, and also at identifying testable hypotheses about what biases human beings have shown that human beings haven't identified before. And this is relevant to climate change, that we may be able to figure out some biases that people are showing in their choices that we don't even know yet. Okay, here are some paths forward that are uh, right around the corner. First, restrictions on the equivalent of dominated options might be imposed by law as long as it is clear what is dominated. Here's what I'm thinking, that for retirement plans, some people in the United States are asked, do you want to choose plan A, B, C, D, or E, when plan E is the same as plan A, but worse? It's exactly the same, but it costs more. Or it's exactly the same, but it doesn't offer a certain kind of benefit. This can be true for retirement or health care. And people will choose dominated options for reasons that we don't fully understand. With respect to climate-related AI, to forbid the inclusion of the dominated option, that's a really good idea. We might also exclude and use choice engines to eliminate shrouded attributes, including hidden fees. So for purchases of various sorts, there might be hidden things that are economic or environmental, and they should be either eliminated or made visible. Here's an example for you. It's less hidden now than it was 10 years ago, but electric cars cause electricity to get charged. That's an environmental issue. It's more of an environmental issue if coal is being used. It's also an economic issue. That should be unshrouded. Choice engines powered by AI have massive potential to improve consumer welfare and to reduce externalities, but without regulation, it's not clear they'll always do that. Okay.
Those who design choice engines may or may not count as fiduciaries, but we might want to consider them metaphorically that, scrutinizing for deception and man manipulation with an eye toward internality and externality reduction. Okay, there's been a fair bit of material here. The largest affective lesson signaled, I hope, by the AI-generated pleasing bright light is there's a lot of room for optimism here. And in this case, it's entirely realistic. It had better be because of what we hold in our hands, our planet. Thanks. Thank you very much for that uh, provocative and engaging uh, presentation. We can start with uh, questions uh, uh, and comments from the audience. So uh, first, uh, V, you can introduce yourself and what school you're from and, and or position you're at. That would be sure. Great. Uh, v Danish, I'm the vice dean and faculty director of the ESG initiative at the Wharton School. Um, Implicit in the presentation is a trade-off um, between uh, the costs of a paternalistic state regulation and and uh, maintaining the benefits of free choice and liberty and individual and and that being two key elements in our battle uh, to manage the climate transition. There was a bullet I think on your second to last slide that talked about potential for manipulation. And I think it's important to acknowledge the role of oil companies, the American Petroleum Institute, and their potential to use AI to seed misinformation to people using social media algorithms. And that there's a countervailing corporate interest uh, that is uh, being exhibited. Where does that come into the discussion of choice engines, AI, and climate change? How do we acknowledge the role uh, and, and the relatively well-established role, I would argue, um, not just of people who have meaningful disagreements as you started with, but outright efforts to confuse uh, deceive and underplay the costs uh, of the social cost of carbon and otherwise? It's, it's a fantastic question. So let's take project number one, uh, consumer choices and their improvement. N noticing that if we succeeded in that, uh, the gains for choosers would be huge and the gains for the environment would also be huge if the choice engines were externality focused and to my knowledge, the externality focused choice engine, that's not in place. Now then there's, uh, what do we call it? The marketplace of ideas, where if people are saying things that are false, that's a problem. And if they're using AI to spread things that are false, that's a, a problem on steroids. Uh, offhand, as a good devoted follower of Edmund Burke, I'd, I'd want to follow the charted paths with respect to falsehoods. And uh, there are legal restrictions on, on certain kinds of falsehoods. Whether those should be stronger than they now are in this context, I think is a really hard question. So we have categories. If I sell, sell you a car saying this doesn't emit any greenhouse gases, and that's false, that's against the law, even though it's speech. If I say that climate change is, is not a problem or the social cost of carbon is one penny, those are not legally prohibited. And I think anyone should be nervous about the idea of making them be prohibited. So I have a kind of Brandeis Holmes uh, knee jerking here, which is, uh, more speech rather than enforce silence. Uh, I think you you might be thinking, not unreasonably. Good luck with that. And so this is this is a, this is a problem. And I'll say, say a little bit more, which is bears very much on your question. It isn't in these remarks. Um, Let's say I said, I won't do it because that would be mean, 
but if I did it, it would work. Let's say something I knew to be false, and I told you it was false in real time. Some part of your mind would think it was true, even weeks later. So if people hear something false, especially if they hear it more than once, their mind tends to think it's true. Even if they're told in real time it's false. And for many social problems, that's a challenge. Do we would we find Cass, do you think that we would find the um, the path that you've charted with choice engines being a vehicle, not the only one, I take it, but a vehicle for uh, uh, addressing the climate problem? Does it get do they would these choice engines be nimble enough to uh, reflect changes either in people's own preferences or in you know, changes in social norms or the like. I mean, I think to the, the large language models that we have today, uh, the chat GPT that's sort of only current up to a certain uh, um, a period of time, for example, and, and making forecasts based upon what is out there now in terms of the language and, and the like, uh, would would there be a concern or, uh, about the stickiness of the of the choice engine pathway that you you've painted? Okay, here's uh, to quote a great man: "I have a dream," <laughs> and and the dream is one where it's, this is less elevated dream than the famous dream, but the, where every American who's deciding what let's say appliance to buy just goes to a place and it will tell them everything they want to know and it will also tell them about the climate impact. And it, that should have a, a norm effect. Now it should be that it could be LLM powered. It could be an LLM thing. So you're having a conversation and then you find out in five minutes, this is the refrigerator for me. And it, it might be that you'd think that because it costs a little more, even over the lifetime of use, but it's environmentally a lot better. Or you might think it's going to be a big winner on environmental grounds, and also I'm going to save a lot of money. Now, current ChatGPT, you're completely right, it's not nimble. If you put in, uh, the, what are the latest articles of the gentleman on my left? It won't, it won't have them. Because right. it doesn't know. <laughs> they they came too fast. <laughs> Still, it's it's kind of remarkable we don't have environmentally focused choice engines for things. If we could get forty thousand people to use them, the better is good. We do it'd be a lot better. In the frontier, we'll bring a microphone. So I'm, I'm hoping that you know about um, Dr. Ann Christian Duhane's book, Minding the Climate. I'm sorry to dash your hope. <laughs> she's a neurologist and she's, so the first part of the book is just how the brain works and why messaging climate change doesn't work in terms of our um, animal response system. You know, we have a brain that was built, you know, 20,000 years ago. And, you know, since this isn't an immediate threat, it's a threat, as you said, a year and a day or whatever, some, some, even though it is obviously upon us in many ways right now, but um, our ability to sort of respond to it appropriately is, is not in our, the DNA of our brain. Um, so the choice engine hopefully can help override. That's somewhat to do with your biases. But also, you know, what it says is that people don't respond well when they get the actual facts because they the fear, the, you know, the hide, the, you know, th those responses tend to override an intelligent response that says, oh, I get it. 
existential. That means we're all going to die. I think we better do something. So, um, you know, the overriding of that and, and, and then how you can message through the positive things seems, seems very much connected to how our brains do and don't function. Okay, so there, there are behavioral accounts of uh, relative insensitivity to the climate threat, which point to present bias, unrealistic optimism, the lack of a noted villain, and these are all very important and uh, and clearly true. Um, uh, as you're talking, and thank you for raising this, uh, I'm pondering exactly how to map on the the human minds. Let's say focus on is a tiger chasing me, and am I about to be eaten, or at some date in a future, is it going to be hotter, and how bad is that? I kind of like the summer. I'm thinking how much of a contributor is that to the climate problem? It is a contributor, but I'm, I'm puzzling over how much. And it's because if everyone in this room, let's say, overcomes your, our behavioral biases, every one of us, and my guess is among relevant populations, this is a pretty unbiased room with respect to climate change, then what are we going to do? And the fact that the United States hasn't done more with respect to climate change undoubtedly has something to do with that, but it has something to do with other things for which choice engines could be helpful. I was having a lunch with someone who works, like this is the person's job, on climate change and China. And the claim made about China was that China has a lot to think about. They want their economy to grow. They have fantastic coal reserves. Yes, they're concerned about climate change, but the idea of you know going into a climate change focused year is not appealing given the range of things they're focusing on, not unreasonably. And this isn't a claim that the United States or China is in the right place with respect to climate change, but it is a claim that it's it's not that the United States or China the, at the official level is un, unaware of the gravity of the climate threat. And, and so, you know, both countries have done a lot in my view, not nearly enough, but a lot to deal with climate change. Why is that? Well, in the United States, the energy efficiency rules, which are a little like a low-tech choice engine, they are, uh, the benefits are crushing the costs. And the officials know that. What are the benefits? Externality reduction, internality reduction. Are the costs real? Absolutely. Refrigerators are going to cost more up front. They do cost, but it's worth it. So I'm, I'm thinking that the, this is the number of barriers is very high. And uh, some of them are political, yes. And, and if everyone in Massachusetts, where I live much of the time, thought climate change is problem number one, then what's Massachusetts going to do? It's not going to ban the internal combustion engine in 2024 or 2025. It's not going to forbid the use of coal. Probably shouldn't do either of those things. But there's a lot to do. And this is the promise of AI to help us figure out what to do. So I'm thinking a little bit, I've had some kind of modest exposure to the India Life Initiative, and India is such a fundamental country for climate change, and the leadership there is very focused on climate change. What concretely can be done? A lot of it involves individual choice. But if you ask people to choose better for the climate, that's hard. AI can make it easy. 
in the, also in the front, and then we'll be going to the back. Hi. Uh, um, well, thanks very much, Eric Ortz at the Wharton School. Uh, thanks very much for being here. And uh, first, I was uh, not liking the idea of this uh, of, of of a uh, of a of a of a of a, cho of a choice engine, but uh, but I think I'm coming around to it, and you're convincing. The question I have is, who do you think should build the choice engines, and what? Uh, is the respective roles of the private sector on in these problems, and what, if any, should the role of the government be on these? Since there is a danger of of backfiring, right, or people not liking this, or feeling that it's being imposed on them, uh, and I guess the meta question is, how do you get people to choose to use choice engines rather than to rebel against them? Okay, a, a number of years ago, there were light bulb jokes. How many lawyers does it take to change a light bulb? How many engineers does it take to change a light bulb? How many football players? And none of them was funny, except one, which was how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. It's pretty good. Um, so the light bulb has to want to change. So we need to have choice engines, which are believed by people who are contemplating use, that this is a really good thing. I'll, I'll give an example from the, the domain of retirement savings, which is not as thrilling in areas there of climate change, but we have things which are either like choice engines or the thing itself, and people deciding what plans to choose when they devote any attention to it at all, find them a godsend. Because how do you know? And you you get something that's like a choice engine. They should be much better, which just tells you stuff and then you figure it out. Or doctors often now are working as choice engines with or without AI. We probably have people with medical expertise in the room, and AI will make it much easier. So a patient has a choice, do X, which is, let's say, aggressive, but has risks, or Y, which is less aggressive and doesn't have risks. The aggressive has risks of this magnitude if you do it, this problem if you don't do it, and, the, and then it's, it's like a choice engine. And it and patients, they really need that. I'll give you a little, little, little data. Um, uh, I worked with a, a doctor a few years ago on uh, behavioral biases and patients. And we took a bunch of people who were in the hospital for their annual checkup, basically, not for an acute condition, for an annual checkup. And we asked them to uh, to do the cognitive reflection test, which is basically a test on cognitive capacity. And they did the lowest score of any population ever on the cognitive reflection test. They weren't dumb. They were just through the floor in their performance because they were in the doctor's office and they were either stressed or preoccupied. And how were they going to do an intelligence test? So people who are under stress or under uh, some sort of pressure from something. Maybe they're really busy. Their a choice engine is essential. So I, your point is great about trust. On the private sector or public sector, that's a, also a fantastic question. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, as a longtime University of Chicago person, my uh, intuitive reaction is private sector, uh, trustworthy competition. Let's see what happens. But it's not clear that's right. If you look at school choices, the Department of Education, last I checked, this is so easily knowable, has done things to make college choices easier by telling people things that are on something like a choice engine. And my understanding is, you all would know, is that's pretty trustworthy. I'm confident Penn and Wharton beat everybody on every dimension. Are you starting to trust it better? At least Penn and Wharton are at the, either at the top or very close to the top. 
and that's you know reflective of the um, database nature of the relevant choice engine for education. So for government to do it is really interesting. There is something called the greenhouse gas inventory. Here's this is pre current at least AI. There's a greenhouse gas inventory. You know about this in the United States. It was adopted in 2010, 2011. And the thought was the greenhouse gas inventory would be relatively costless and it could have a positive impact in cutting emissions because who wants to be in the newspaper as the biggest emitter in Oregon? Uh, there's a National Bureau of Economic Research paper showing the greenhouse gas inventory did a significant amount in cutting greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Just the inventory did because people didn't want to be called out as big emitters. Did it reduce enough? Not nearly. Was it positive? Absolutely. And this was a government done thing. We can think of it as a pre-AI choice engine, kind of. Okay, in the back, yeah. So I'll bring a microphone to you. Uh, hello, I'm Bruno, an undergraduate student at the Wharton School. I'm a big fan. Um, and in a similar vein to in response to the previous question in terms of the backfire effect, um, there is a significant portion of the world's population that doesn't even believe in the climate problem. And also in terms of AI, there's fierce advocates for AI. And then there's also a proportion of the population that is afraid of the next age of Ultron. Um, so I guess my question to you is how important is it that as a community and as a uh, world that we're on the same page and whether or not it's a question of time that we don't have or doing it in a non-paternalistic way? Okay, that's great. Uh, there are two things, uh, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and increased resilience and adaptation. In my various roles and travels, I've learned that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is polarizing, uh, greater resilience against flood risk, wildfire risk, drought risk, extreme heat, that's not polarizing. So strategies that are very focused on those things tend to create nods rather than what kind of person are you? So that's an opportunity. Uh, choice engines can be immensely helpful in helping people to make choices in accordance with which they're more resilient. And gosh, do we need that. Extreme heat is a mounting problem and whatever people disagree about about climate change, if it's 103 out, that's dangerous. And to do something this summer to make that okay, that gets uh, keen interest. Uh, with respect to mitigation, solution aversion is connected with it. If you think that the consequence of mitigation is a carbon tax or regulatory aggression, you might think, I, I don't worry about climate change that much. But if you think it's that there's going to be a lot of green jobs and entrepreneurial activity, then the data suggests more enthusiasm. So here's a kind of behavioral thought that I think it bears on many things. Let's see, see how we get at it. Uh, Amazon markets some of its products as having frustration-free packaging. Does anyone use frustration-free packaging? I'm looking at the men in the room because if you buy an electric shaver, frustration-free packaging, I find great because you don't have to deal with all this stuff that cuts your hands and requires you to have extremely sophisticated equipment to get the, <laughs> the shaver out. But frustration-free packaging, it's really green packaging. It's an environmental thing. It's not a consumer convenience thing. We have to do a little work to find that out. What their, I guess their call is that green packaging would put off many of their choosers and frustration-free packaging just makes everyone smile. 
And I think in the climate change area, we've adopted the equivalent of green packing stra packaging strategies, the effective equivalent, when what we should adopt is the equivalent of frustration-free packaging. And then you would create less in the way of division. We have, uh, I think, one last question in the front here. Uh, thanks, thanks for your presentation. Um, I'm very honored to be here, and I'm a visiting scholar at Penn Carey Law School. And uh, my name is Wang Bin. Uh, my question is similar, like the last one, is uh, who is the main, who should take the main responsibility for uh, using the AI tools? Uh, it means does the Congress need to uh, make the new laws to authorize the government to use AI tools to guide people's behavior? Uh, or the government could uh, use the AI tools uh, 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 um, from the authority, uh, get the authority from the existing laws? Uh, and all, all, uh, uh, is the uh, big big tech company should uh, take their responsibilities, social responsibilities, to uh, use the AI tools to guide people's uh, behaviors. Because I think uh, we not only need to use AI to guide people's behavior, but we also reg regulate the uh, actions of using AI. Okay, then this is a fantastic question. So offhand for the um, automobile, automobile companies to be using AI to help consumers choose vehicles, that would be fantastic. And it would be potentially in the company's interest if it's about internality reduction. Now, we have to qualify this because it might be exploitation of behavioral biases is profit maximizing. Um, it's to be hoped the market would fix that. If not, to have something like what the current FTC is doing about the exploitation of behavioral biases as a form of deceptive trade practice. Have you picked up on this little revolution in the last few years where uh, exploitation of behavioral biases is a target of our government. And to do that with respect to choice engines would also be a good idea. I'm thinking uh, as you talk, this is also great. Thank you, both of you, for raising the uh, private or public question. I'm thinking for, let's let's have a just a country, Canada. Uh, to have Canada's environmental authorities uh, experimenting with the choice engine uh, my guess is that so long as there's no mandate imposed, all they need is an appropriation. They don't need a legislative act. They need the money. And this, this shouldn't be very expensive. And to say this is what the Department of Education did something like this in the United States without, I believe, specific authorization as general, general authorization, to have here's our, here it is. And we'd like comments on how to make it better. Use it if you want. And then the EPA, the Canadian EPA, could ramp up externality focus. And it, it could have a backfiring effect, but it could have a catalytic effect. And just piggyback on that, I know that I said that would be the last question. In drawing on your expertise in free speech, I could imagine a world in which we all are dependent on choice engines developed by the private sector. It then becomes pretty tempting for government, doesn't it, to say, well, everybody out there has these choice engines in their pockets. Uh, we could actually do a better job of solving certain problems by mandating tweaking of the algorithms and the preferences. That's fantastic. Can I tell you a story? Yeah. We're being recorded and yeah. this is, very slightly sensitive, but world, you're welcome to hear this. Um, I asked someone who was involved in the Paris negotiations uh, how the United States and China got together. They were the drivers, the United States and China together. How did the United States and China get together? And the answer was, well, China was 
uh, aware that people in Beijing had on their cell phone information that showed them how clean the air, the air was. And the Chinese knew there was a lot of public emphasis on reduction of environment, environmental problems in China. And I said, I don't understand. That's about like particulate matter. It's not about greenhouse gases. And, and he said, you really don't understand. The same uh, uh, energy sources that produce the, the dirty air produce greenhouse gas emissions. So China was very focused on responding to what people saw on their cell phones was a, was a health risk. And that I think that's very consistent with your yeah. patient. Well, listen, I think we we don't need a choice engine to conclude that it's been a remarkable choice to be here with you. And we're so grateful that your choice engine internally uh, uh, led you to come and spend the whole day with us and, and give of your time and and share with us a provocative and I think really, really important set of ideas about a path forward to do better and better is good. So thank you very much, Cass.